Many of us feel confused. We feel lost. We go through these moments of back and forth. And I just want to simply look at that question today of what's God up to. And as, as I just finished out uh, five months as the pastor here, then there becomes that question as well, not only in our own life, but what's God up to at New Life Assembly of God? What is God doing? What does God have planned? What is going on? And today, I hope to help you to be able uh, to um, look at that uh, in your own life and to understand some things that need to take place. We're going to be in uh, Romans chapter 12, um, a uh, very, very important uh, part of Scripture uh, that just sets up for so much of the walk for believers in Christ and uh, looking in... Uh, verse 1. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. This is your what? True and proper worship. You want to worship God. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. It goes on here to say, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, if, if you've not heard me say this before, or if you've not heard this before, what you need to know when you're reading Scripture is, when, whenever you see the word therefore in Scripture, what do you need to do? Ask, what's it there for? Okay? I mean, you got to back up a little bit. you got to go and look at some other things that are happening there. When we get to chapter 12 in Romans, uh, Paul's making a shift from, the doc from, from doctrine to duty. From what you're supposed to do to this is how you carry it out. He is making a shift from creed to conduct, from principles to practice. This is basically here where he's saying, okay, all of that stuff, get ready. This is how you put it in place. And this is how you are to walk through this. We must not only know, but we must grow. And instead of just filling our heads with God's word, God's word must impact our attitudes and our actions. Hear me on that. God's word must impact our attitudes and our actions if we're going to be the believers in Christ that God has called us to be. Otherwise, all you're doing is simply reading a book. Maybe for some of you, you're memorizing the book too. The problem is, is that we're supposed to put action to what we read. So we've got to keep that in mind. As we get up to this, uh, therefore here, there are other therefores in here. If you go back and look, there's the therefore of condemnation in Romans chapter 3 verse 20. There's the therefore of justification. Romans 5.1, the therefore of assurance, Romans 8.1, and now to, to chapter 12 is the therefore of surrender. So there's a lot of therefores here in Romans, and, and we lead up to this one, but just before we get into Romans chapter 12, back up a little bit here, and look at those last few verses in Romans chapter 11. It says, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond finding out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has seen his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory. Amen. So this sets us up to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. So all of that, he says, I urge you, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So he sets all that up for us. Romans 12.1 must be linked to everything that comes before it and everything that comes after it. It's got to be linked. It's got to stay connected in all of that. We can't fully understand the verses of this unless we look before and we look after because 
Context is king. Say that with me. Context is king. We have to understand context in scripture. Okay? There are a lot of uh, false doctrines out there because of the lack of context. Because we want to look at one particular part of scripture, one particular verse without taking in everything all together. So context matters here. So as we're asking this question, what's God up to? Essentially, we're trying to figure out, God, what's your will? God, what's your plan? God, what's your purpose? Agree? So we're trying to figure out when we're like, God, God, what are you up to? Here is what you've got to know. If you're serious about knowing God's will, then you can't say no to God's will. See, some of us, we want to determine and find out God's will, and then when we do, we're like, mm, don't think, nope. Not doing that. No. If we're serious about knowing God's will, we can't say no to God's will. We have got to say yes, much like what we heard the phrase from Maria today. Our veterans signed a blank check. They said, whatever I'm told to do, I'm going to do it. They signed up first to find out their mission later, right? Very similar in our faith walk. We say yes, Jesus, to whatever else comes after that. To whatever else is going to be after that. So we have to be willing to say yes. Ephesians uh, chapter 5 says, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. In order to know God's will, Romans 12 teaches us that there are at least three conditions that must be met for people to know God's will. For people to be able to hear the answer, what's God up to? So to learn what God is up to first, seems, seems basic, but some people are still off of this. We must be saved. I know it seems very basic. Some of you are like, well, duh. Okay. But there's some people that just don't get it. Okay. Because they want to try and find out God's masterful plan without spending time with the master. They want to find out all of these things that God has, but they don't want to spend time with him. Based on all that God has done, Paul says here, I urge you. He, he, he is pleading with them. He, he is almost begging them. The word means to call near or to invite and he uses the terms uh, brothers, brothers and sisters, indicating his affection for them as members of God's family. It's not just, hey, you. Okay? It's not, you know, Paul wasn't, you know, just going about his business like, hey, homie. Right? He uses brother. He uses this compassionate because he cares about them. He says, you've got to get this. The baseline is, are you saved? Are you saved or are you just experimenting? Are you saved or are you just playing church? Or what is happening in that? Until you are, you won't be in a position to know God's will. In John chapter 10, Jesus makes an interesting statement to some Pharisees. And he's using an illustration here that, that they would be very familiar with for what was happening in the time of day. And he's going to use an illustration with sheep and shepherds. They all knew that. Whether they were or not, they were familiar with this to which Jesus said, about trying to see who was going to um, understand faith the best. And he says, his sheep follow him because they know his voice. And if you look in that portion of uh, scripture there, Jesus even indicates to them, and some sheep have not yet been gathered. He was talking about not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles. So why is this so important? Here it is. It's because those people that are in relationship with the shepherd have the, have the ability to follow him because they're tuned in to the shepherd's voice. Some of you have some voices that you need to quiet down. Okay? Some of you need to quiet down the voice of friends. Okay? Well... But I know that they want the best for me. Do they love Jesus? No, but they've always been around for me really good. Then 
quiet that voice. Listen to the voice of Jesus. Listen to the Holy Spirit and what he wants and what he is saying. Don't listen to everything else. The plea is made here in view of God's mercy. The original word used for mercy is actually plural and refers to God's multitude of mercies. Anyone in here thankful that God's mercy is not a one-time shot? I know I am. But his mercy is over and over and over and over again. If you're serious about knowing God's will, you can't say no to God's will. So if you're trying to figure out what's God up to when he tells you, the answer needs to be yes. Secondly, we need to be surrendered. First, we need to be saved. Second, we need to be surrendered. Paul gives us two ways to fully express our surrender to God. First, he says, give him your body. We are urged in view of the many mercies of God to offer our bodies as living sacrifice. The word offer is a technical term that is used to describe the bringing and presenting of an animal to a sacrifice at the altar. To offer means to give, to present once and for all. Think about that. To offer your bodies. Whenever they offered up the sacrifice of the animals in the Old Testament, okay? Stephen King wasn't around yet. Okay? There was no pet cemetery. Okay? They weren't coming back. Okay? They gave those animals once and for Some of you will get that later on. They gave those animals once and for all. That was it. Here is this spotless, pure, sacrifice. So, so God is saying, whenever you do it, give it all. Paul's saying, give it all. Don't go back. Give it all. Now, the Jewish people understood sacrifices and other types of sacrifices, but the idea of a living sacrifice is something new to them. Like, whoa, 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 hang on a minute. Are, do you mean like Abraham and Isaac living sacrifices? Like people? Yeah, that's exactly what he's saying here. He's saying you've got to offer up your bodies to give them to God. Not just a little bit here, not just a little bit there, but the whole thing. Because God does not want to be part of our lives. He wants to be our life. He doesn't just want to be here and be there. and He doesn't want to be a God of convenience. He wants to be the God of constant in our lives. He wants to be constant. In our, he wants every single day that we're pursuing him all of the time. The second way to be surrendered to God is to give him your mind. Verse 1 calls for a decisive commitment to fully surrender. Verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So, whenever some of you came to faith... If, if all of the sudden you begin to think a little bit differently and see things a little bit differently and people who knew you before were kind of like, you're a little different. You're doing it right. <laughs> okay? Because our minds are supposed to be changed. Our minds are supposed to be trans. I see things a whole lot differently now than I did before I was saved. I even see things differently now in faith than I saw them five or ten years ago. Because, because I've tried to grow up in faith and I didn't just say, well, I'm saved. So, so what I know is what I know. So I'm not going anywhere from here. If you still have some of the same bullheaded beliefs in your mind that are supported with scripture that you had 30 years ago, something's wrong. You need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, I, I don't really, when it comes down to it, we can say, well, you know, the problem with the world is the problem, you know, is that there's no God and the problem with, 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 you know, this and that is because there's no faith and because they took God out of schools and because I, the problem is 
people in the church. No one took God out of anywhere. It became cloudy as to who was really saved. Sometimes people in the church are so conformed to the world that there's little noticeable difference between Christians and non-Christians. This is why God is not in schools. I mean, we know he's there every time there's a test. Okay. This is the reason why there's so much pushback against the church is because there's become very little noticeable difference between those in the church and those not of the church because we're so conformed to the world because it's hard to tell us apart. Now, we don't need to go to one extreme and be the crazy Christian person that no one wants to be around. <laughs> Some of you just thought of someone else and you need to repent right now. You need to repent of that. <laughs> But yet we can't go over here to say, well, that's, well, that's not my fight. That's not my battle. I'm not going to deal with that. Just they can believe what they want to believe. We have got to stand up for the word of God and do it in a way that reflects Jesus. That people know who we are. Some of you are facing incredible temptations in life. Maybe it is... Pulled to conform, to go along with friends, to go along with business ventures, to go along with something that is not of God, but it's of the world, and you're being pulled in that, and I caution you and I say, don't give in to that. If it seems too good to be true, it probably is, okay? And if your friend that you haven't seen in 12 years calls you up out of the blue to tell you about a business proposition, <laughs> some of you just thought of someone else, and again, you need to repent. Okay? Don't, don't sell yourself short of eternity. Don't sell yourself short of what people can see Jesus in you for fame or for money or for awareness, or for position. Stay committed to Christ, because what God's up to is something in me, and he's up to something in you that he needs some other people to see. That's what God's up to, but we've got to let him work. We've got to let him be in there. The word transformed refers to interchange. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 18. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. I want to make this statement, and I want you to hear me when I make this statement. When you hear someone say, I just don't like God or I just don't like Jesus. No, they don't like who has represented God or who has represented Jesus. Because if they really knew God, if they really knew Jesus, they could do nothing but love him. Because they would understand his love. But the problem is, is that we don't always give the best example of God, of Jesus in this. Notice the last part of uh, Romans 12 too, then we will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God will not force us into anything. I hope we understand that, okay? God will not force us into anything. But he's saying, don't be conformed. I want you transformed. Then you will find God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. If there is no, no substantial change in your life, if there's no substantial change in your way of thinking, if there's no substantial change in the way that you talk to people, if there's no substantial change in your lifestyle after faith and in faith, then don't expect to understand God's will. Doesn't work like that. He says, be transformed and then you'll understand my will. See, it's, you know, it's kind of like that you know, someone's like, hey, can you help me with something? You're like, depends on what it is. Fortunately, we treat God like that sometimes. 
when God's like, hey, can you, uh, uh, hey, Jehovah, just depends. I'm not sure. God doesn't work like that. He, he doesn't tell us first and then we decide. We have to decide first because God simply wants our will before he'll show us his will. What's our will that he wants? Our willingness to do whatever he wants. He wants us to give up our own personal desires, our own personal plans. He wants us to give those up to him and then he will show us his will. And not a moment too soon. Okay? Whereas I say, you know, God's never late. He's never early either. Okay? He's on time. So he's not going to all of a sudden play, let's make a deal with you. Okay, this one time, I'll show you what I'm going to do, and then you can decide if you want to change. It doesn't work like that. We have to transform first. Think of it this way. Why should God reveal his will to you if he doesn't think you're all that interested in doing it anyways? Why should he reveal his will, his plan for you if you're not all that interested in carrying it out anyways? What if he was not all that interested in giving up his son? Or what if him giving his son was conditional on only the people that loved him. When I read it, it tells me that God loved the whole world. He loved us all. So he gave us his son to die for us. He didn't do that so that we could be half in. He did that so that we can just say, God, I'll serve you. God, I'll follow you. God, whatever you are up to, I want to be part of it. And finally, to know what God's up to, we need to be sharpened by others. As we move ahead a little bit more in this, we come face to face with the truth that we're designed to live out God's will in the context of relationships. I didn't think I would share much on veterans today, military today, but it just kind of working in, I think this is great, is that here is what we will not find our military men and women doing is going on solo missions. We don't see them sending out one person to get a job done. They move in teams. They move together. Matter of fact, they say, hey, you don't leave anyone behind. We always go back. So in the context of our faith, we need to have relationships. God did not call you to be this person that you love Jesus at home on your own. You come to church just as we start and you leave just as we end. You're like, I want nothing to do with nobody else. God didn't call you to walk in faith like that. It's about relationships. Because first we're to denounce pride. Verse 3, for by grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. So, so what Paul's saying here is, hey, it's not about you. Don't think of your, you know, don't think you're all that in a bag of chips. Denounce pride. Because thinking more highly of ourselves than we should is one of the greatest deterrents to knowing and doing God's will. Some people in the church have a problem with God's will because we begin to think that we know more than God or we can do better than God can do. Or, be, or we think that we understand God's will uh, more for the church than what someone else does because we've been around longer. We have to denounce that pride. We have to swallow that pride. And understand that God's will is going to look different today than it even did 10 years ago. It's going to shift. It's going to change. It's going to move about. Yes, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God never changes, but his methods do. 
Things are done a little bit differently today. But it doesn't mean that we have to be prideful people. That we can't let these things go. Can we just remember that faith is a gift from God and he simply uses us because he chooses to? Don't be mistaken. God loves you. God's got a plan for you. But God is for God. Mm. I'm touchy there. God is for God. He just uses us in the process for his will. I'm thankful that God will, will never give up on me. But at the end of the day, I know that if I give up on God, God is still God. And God still has a plan, regardless of me. And also in verse 4, it says, Just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. That sounds to me like we're to celebrate differences. Nope. You don't agree with me. Nope. You can't be different than me because I know it all. And I've been around. And I've read my Bible 37 times from front to back. <laughs> so you cannot see differently than me on this matter. You are wrong. It says here to celebrate our differences. Okay? Some of those differences that really at the end of the day, they're not theological heaven and hell issues. Can I just be real? Okay? There are too many spirit-filled people that put too much emphasis on the filling of the spirit. To even go as far as to say, if you're not spirit-filled, if you're not spoken tongues, you're not going to heaven. You're wrong. Because they're not willing to celebrate differences. There's the people who think that we have to dress one way. Or that we have to worship one way. We celebrate differences. My wife had a conversation with someone at work this past week, I think, and they were trying to find a church. And so, of course, it comes out somehow, some way. I think she's a little more quicker than I am to tell people I'm a pastor. Okay? I try to keep that classified, locked down. Okay? <laughs> As best I can. It was a little easier whenever I was bivocational because like, what do you do? Oh, I'm sales for Culligan. <laughs> pastor, you're ashamed of being pastor. N no, I'm not. I don't want them to be any different toward me. But my wife was sharing about, you know, her husband's a pastor and so on. And, you know, started talking about the church and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then they went on to talk about what they don't like about the church. They just didn't like when pastors got up to preach the word of God with their shirt untucked. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know why we need all these lights and everything. <laughs> this is someone that's, their Christian life must be miserable. Because they're not able to celebrate differences. Almost to the fact that it seemed to Amy that that they would say that there is no way that God can move in those places. They're not willing to celebrate differences. It's hard to know what God's up to if we're not willing to see that uh, God created everyone. God created some people to speak English and some people to speak other languages. And God created some to be white and some to be dark and some to be brown and some to be tan and some to be all of these other colors. And he gave some blonde hair and some black hair and some brown head and eventually some no hair. <laughs> but God, God is a God of nations. Meaning that God is a God of differences. Now there are some things that we just don't allow differences on. If they don't believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, went to cross and died for them, and he's coming back again, sorry. That's not a difference I can get on board with. Okay? 
But I can get on board with someone that says, Pastor, I'm showing up to suit every week and or I'm showing up to church every week in a suit. Great, I can get on board with that. Pastor, I'm showing up in shorts every week. Great, I can get on board with that. You know, uh, you guys found out that when pastor doesn't preach, he shows up in flip-flops. <gasps> okay, why can't I be comfortable like you on the days I don't preach? Like, how are they supposed to know who the pastor is? Just ask. <laughs> I've heard that before. Whenever I was in church once and we were, you know, looking at dress and attire and these things, we were going back and forth, back and forth, and someone, you know, someone raised their hand and says, well, if the pastor's not wearing a suit, how are they supposed to know who he is? <laughs> to which someone else replied, he's the one preaching. <laughs> or if everyone has suits on, he's got the cheapest one. <laughs> But sometimes we don't want to allow for these differences. <laughs> we have to embrace dependency. <laughs> Romans 12, 5. So in Christ, we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. I am so thankful for my non-spirit-filled friends. Okay? I'm so thankful for my colleagues that pastor Methodist churches and Baptist churches. I'm so thankful for them. I'm so thankful for, for people of faith out there, whether they worship in a home or they worship in a sanctuary of 2,000. I'm so thankful for all of them because they all matter, because they're all important. Because while we're uniquely designed, we've been made to function in community with one another because each of us belongs to one another. I mean, the kingdom of God is a powerful thing that can take someone who is, who Ohio has pretty much been their whole life and take them to Oklahoma and say, here you go and give me a community called New Life Assembly to just put me into. And we have our differences and we see things a little bit differently. And I say some things a lot differently, but that's okay. I think you're understanding me a little bit better. And there are some things I'm not afraid to say. And you're like, there's nothing you're afraid to say, Pastor. Um, <laughs> We'll figure it out, okay? But just, but we have to know that I need sharpened by you. And you need sharpened by me. Amen. And the boys in youth ministry need sharpened by the men. Yes. And the girls in youth ministry need sharpened by the women. Yeah. And the worship team needs sharpened by the board members and the board members need sharpened by the worship team. The media team, they got it going on, so just leave them. No, I'm just kidding. So we, <laughs> we, we all need sharpened. Look at the heart when someone's trying to, sharp, to sharpen you a little bit. Let's stop with this as someone's talking. We're trying to get ready for a comeback instead of listening to what they're saying. Right? James speaks about that a little bit. Be quick to listen. Slow to speak. Slow to become angry. Some of you guys are like, yeah, I don't like that scripture. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you like it. It'll be the difference of what I say earlier. Some people have a hard time seeing a noticeable difference of Christians and non-Christians. Christians, we should not be so quick to anger. So if you want to know what God's up to, make sure your life is right with God. Be living your life for God the best that you possibly can. And then once you've done that, surrender to God whatever he asks for. Whatever he wants of you, surrender it to him. And then finally, be sharpened by those around you. Let each other build each other up. 